Good morning, everybody. Very warm welcome to St. George's. Lovely to see you. And if we haven't seen each other, um, Happy New Year. Okay, it's still Happy New Year time, I think, if you haven't seen each other. Now, just some great news. We've been praying and working towards um, Alpha 24. We had such a wonderful night on Tuesday. It was Tuesday, Tuesday evening. We had 61 people in the room, um, you know, loads of guests, uh, a real, really lovely atmosphere. People didn't want to go home. We wanted to finish at 9 o'clock, but they wanted to stay around. Um, so it's not too late to join the Alpha course if you've got friends that want to come along, because um, really it was just the introduction last week. Week one proper, who is Jesus, starts this week. So if you know somebody or if... Um, yeah, if you, and you want to invite somebody, it's not too late. This Tuesday, let us know if you're coming so we can plan for catering. Um, and do continue to pray for Alpha in the weeks ahead. And then one other notice about tonight. It's one of, it's, uh, we do worship nights about once a term, and tonight is a worship. It's an extended time of worship, of praise, of listening to God, of being together, encouraging one another. And again, um, a warm invitation to all who'd like to have an extended come and have an extended time of singing God's praises together. Um, we look forward to seeing you there. Our sentence, our opening sentence is from our reading a little later on from Hebrews chapter 10. It's an encouragement to us. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess. For he who promised is faithful. Well, let's pray as we settle down as God's people gathering in his presence. Father, thank you that you have called us out to belong to your son, Jesus Christ, and formed us into his body, the church. And as your church, so we pray this morning for that filling of your spirit, for us as living stones who make up a building, a holy temple where your spirit dwells in the midst. Come by your spirit, we pray. Heavenly Father, fill this place, fill our hearts and minds and open our lips that we might declare your praise in this place today and be glorified, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and offer our worship to God in our opening song. Come, now is the time to worship.
just as you are to worship come just as you are before your God come and lift my voice to sing of your goodness to sing of your love I lift my voice to sing hallelujah Jesus our Savior you're worthy of it all I lift my voice to sing of your goodness I lift my voice to sing of your love I lift my voice to sing hallelujah Jesus our Savior you're worthy of it we give you the highest praise we give you the highest praise I'm forgiven. I lift my hands because I'm set free. I lift my hands is a sign of surrender. Jesus, our Savior, you're worthy of it We give you the high. Jesus, our Savior, you're worthy of it all. We give you the highest praise. We give you the highest praise. We give you the highest praise. Jesus, our Savior. remain standing as we think of all that Jesus has done for us, that we're forgiven, that we're set free. So we offer back to him all that we are and all that we have in our offering response. Lord, everything we have comes from you. Please use our gifts to build your kingdom. Please do be seated as we come to our confession. 
The Bible reminds us that Christ himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that free from sin we might live for righteousness. By his wounds we have been healed. So let us confess our sins. Together we say, Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been, help us to amend what we are, and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. And so may the God of love and power Forgive us and free us from our sins. Heal and strengthen us by his spirit and raise us to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. And as God's family together, so we say the family prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And Heavenly Father, as the children and young people and leaders and helpers make their way across to Cheney Lane, we pray you'd bless their activities this morning, that they may walk closely with you and know your love as they gather together in Jesus name. Amen. So children's church and pathfinders time to make your way across. And Steve Burnett's going to come and lead us in our prayers. So let us pray. Lord, we thank you that you know every detail about each one of us. And still you continue to love us. Thank you that you keep every aspect of the universe in balance. Thank you that the sun rises and sets every day and the rhythm of the world is in the palm of your hand. We pray that you'd help us to keep the sense of thanks and wonder of being your people within your creation. Thank you that in this world of strife, you have, through your grace, placed us in a land of peace. Let us give thanks too for the news of last week that the starting meeting of the Alpha Course was so well attended and that attendees enjoyed it so much. We pray that the people who came will come back this week and that nothing will stand in their way. We pray against the attempts of the devil to stop them coming. We ask, Lord, that you would surround them with your holy angels and prompt them to return so that they can learn more about you and what it means to be in committed relationship with you. We pray too for the different mission partners supported by St. George's in different parts of the world. Here in Britain, in Sheffield, where Naomi and Andy continue to reach out to people in Sheffield itself, and also in parts of the world where physical evangelism is impossible but digital evangelism can still reach people who are seeking to know the Christian God. 
And as we think about digital mission, let us remember Sat7, which broadcasts messages of hope into the war-torn nations of the Middle East. There are so many people living in refugee camps or who have been uprooted from their homes, but they can still access the message of hope that Sat7 continues to broadcast. Let us also remember all those Christians in the Middle East, particularly in Palestine and Israel, who are in a no man's land between Jew and Muslim, and who are rejected and ostracized by both sides of the conflict. We pray, O oh Lord, that you'd be close to them, comfort them, and give them real hope for the future. We pray that these Christians may be a voice of reason in that place, and may be used to introduce messages of peace where there is otherwise just the sound of hatred and the noise and destruction of war. We lift to you all those suffering the fear, the brutality, and the emotional trauma of war right now, whether in Ukraine, the Yemen, Sudan, or many other areas of conflict. Would you change the hearts of violent men, O Lord, and replace their hard hearts with hearts that desire peace and harmony? Please protect the innocent and confound the schemes of the wicked. Closer to home, let us spend a moment remembering in our hearts those whom we know who are suffering in any way, through physical or mental illness, bereavement, or in any other way. Lord, we thank you that you hear our prayers of faith and we ask that you'd bring healing and comfort to all these people. And finally, we pray now for the staff team that you've given us here at St. George's, each of them, of them with their own gifts and strengths to bless your body here. We pray that you'd continue to prosper your church here in this place, the villages around Stamford, and also in the churches with which we have close relationship in Grantham and Spalding. And we ask all these things in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. One of the things, new things that we've done this year, just started just before Christmas, is introducing a testimony time, um, just where two or three people for a couple of minutes each. If you've if this is like fresh testimony, some, something that's happened in the last couple of weeks where God has showed up or he's answered a prayer or you've had a wonderful opportunity to share your faith and you just want to share that good moment. Um, so I'm just going to leave some space. If there's somebody here who wants to encourage the brothers and the sisters with a word of testimony, now's your opportunity. Neil, do come. Um, yeah, it helps sometimes to know that these things will happen because then you, then you can't prepare for them. But I want to share something with you which what happened is not really that important. I believe that what it means is so much greater. Um, some of you may know that I struggled with my back for a little while. Um, had four back operations in the last year. Um, and after the fourth one, I have had some worrying symptoms after an initial good recovery, so much so that my physio said that you need to go to the urgent care center. Um, I said, Lord, please, not a fifth operation. But then soon after that, one evening, um, I was lying on my, my stomach because I really couldn't bear the pain. And Next moment, I dreamt very, very um, emphatically almost <laughs> that a doctor comes and says, I have to press on your back to make it better. And the next moment, I had this blinding hot spot in my back. And the next moment, I could literally have gotten up from there and walked 10 kilometers. Instant. All the symptoms gone in one second. The thing that God confronted me with is so much greater, though. 
it's fine that he, re that he restores us. But if that is the God who restores us, who can do in an instant something like that, then isn't it important that we think exactly who he is? That when Jesus says, if you love anyone more than me, you're not worthy of me. Regardless of our confession, regardless of all the years that we spent in the church, regardless of everything that we've done for him, he might come to us one day and quote to us Matthew 7, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. May I quote that to you in full? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will inherit the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, which is judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, have I not prophesied in your name, driven out evil spirits in your name, and done many miraculous things in your name? And I will say to them plainly, go away from me, <clears throat> you evildoers. I never knew you. And it really just shook me up again to say, Jesus is real, he's God, and he's serious. And he spoke to me first, and maybe he speaks to you today too. But thank you for the opportunity. Is there anybody else that would like to share anything? A wonderful testimony. Thank you, Neil. Well, before we sing, be still, let me just, let's give thanks for that word that um, Neil brought. Father, thank you. Thank you for your grace to us in our weakness, that you have the power to stretch out your hand and to restore a back. And thank you that you are so, so real, that you are alive, that you are the God of the universe, the God of heaven and earth who's revealed himself in Jesus Christ, our Lord. And help each of us to know you and to really know you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We stand to sing, Be still for the presence of the Lord. The Holy One is here. is moving in this place. 
sing verse 3 again be still for the power of the Lord is moving in this place he comes to cleanse and heal to minister his grace Jesus that you are here with us this morning. Thank you that we can come before you in reverence and awe. Thank you that you are a God that can heal. Thank you for your goodness and your grace towards us, Jesus. We are here for you this morning. We are here to worship you. Christ is my reward and all of my devotion. Now there's nothing in this world that could ever satisfy. Through every trial, my soul will sing, no turning back. I've been set free, Christ is enough for me, Christ is enough for me, everything I need is in you, everything I Christing my all in all, the joy of my salvation, and this hope will never fail. Heaven is our home. Through every storm, my soul will sing. Jesus is here. To God be the glory, Christ is enough for me, Christ is enough for me, everything I need is in you, everything I decided to follow Jesus no turning back no turning back I have decided to follow Jesus no turning back no turning back the cross before me the world behind me no turning back, no turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back, no turning back. Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough for me. Everything I need is in you. Everything I need. Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough for me. Everything I need. I 
please do be seated as we come to our reading. And we welcome Trina to do um, our reading this morning. If you want to find it, it's in the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, starting at verse 19, and it's on page 1,208. So, Trina, over to you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain, that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Morning, everyone. Great to see you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to those who are on YouTube, watching at home as well, or wherever you are. Great to have you with us as well. Um, Why don't we pray as we come to the reading today. Father, we thank you for your church, which meets in millions of places in every nation in this world, your world, to worship the Lord Jesus. And Lord, we thank you that we are part of your church, both locally here at St. George's and globally, the Bride of Christ. And Lord, we pray today that we might be challenged and changed as we discover new things in your word today. Come by your Holy Spirit, we pray, and speak, for your servants are listening. Amen. Amen. Uh, meet Matthew. Matthew has just relocated to Stanford. He's a mature Christian who's moved into the area and he's ready to dig into the life of St. George's Church. Matthew has never been part of the Church of England before, so frankly he's a little bit suspicious of us. But he's heard that the Bible is preached faithfully here, so he wants to dig in. And at a newcomer's tea, he turns to me and said, so Ben, how do I belong here? Meet Rachel. Rachel's a brand new Christian. She's just completed the Alpha course on which she gave her life to Jesus. She isn't well versed in the things of the Bible yet, but she's eager to learn and passionate about understanding more about who Jesus is. And she happens to be part of lots of clubs and societies in and around Stanford, each of which have a membership list and a subscription fee to pay. And very innocently, she turns to me and says, is there a membership list here? And how much is it to join? How do I belong here? Meet Nigel. Nigel's been a Christian all of his life, And he used to be really involved in the life and ministry of St. George's Church when the children were younger. But just recently, he's been feeling like his roots have been very much loosened. He was good friends with many of those who moved to the Grantham Church plant. And he doesn't really do much now because everything that he did do, he no longer feels able to commit to. And sort of blinking back the tears a bit, says, Ben, how am I meant to belong here? Meet Yolanda. Yolanda's first contact with the church was through Shep. Uh, She uh, had problems with her housing, so she was kicked out, and she was given a new house, but she needed a bed. And that was the start of a long journey of her coming to Friday Connect, and then the New Beginnings Bible study and other things. And over time, she started understanding a bit more about who Jesus was, and she speaks about this feeling when she comes in this place, which you and I know is the Holy Spirit working in her, but she's not quite there yet. But she does see the church is a really good thing. And so turns to me and says, how do I get more involved here? How do I belong here? And the question of how we belong to church, both locally and globally, is going to be the theme of our sermon series over the next five weeks. And the more that I've thought about how each of those people 
fictional as they are, but with some truth in the mix. Um, how do they belong here? The more and more I'm sure that the answer is always the same. And I'm going to come on to that answer in just a moment. There's an administrative answer to that question. Let me just give you that very quickly. The administrative answer might be joining the exciting and sexily named electoral roll. Woo! Now, if you don't know what the electoral roll is, you're in really good company, because I don't have a clue either. No, that's a joke. Um, it's, a, it's basically a list of people who can vote at a boring meeting once a year. That's, that's the entirety of it. It, it. it tries to reflect the true worshipping congregation of who St. George's is, so that when me and Martin go to meetings with other people, the electoral roll shows sort of how many people we, we speak for and represent at those meetings. And you're going to hear a lot more about the electoral roll in April, which is the time at which we uh, tweak it. Um, but being on the electoral roll doesn't really make you belong any more than owning a bike makes you a keen cyclist. It's, it might help, but there's no guarantee. Or secondly, the other administrative thing to do is join what we call church suite. Hands up who gets an email on a Friday from Becky in the office. Great, well, you've already joined Church Suite. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, it's because you haven't yet joined Church Suite. Church Suite is the method by which we sign people up to events, we communicate news and, and the exciting things that are happening to the church family. It's like a, a, a database that we use, and it's a really helpful way to help you belong to the church. But you know what? In my email inbox, I get emails from the Liberal Democrat Party, the Labour Party, and the Conservative Party. I've never been a member of any of them. I don't know where they got my details from. So just receiving emails does not equate necessarily to belonging somewhere. So whilst the electoral roll and church suite help us to belong, possibly, they don't ensure it, do they? So what do I say to Yolanda, to Nigel, to Matthew? How do they belong here, the answer that I've come up with giving is come join, pray, serve, give. Come join, pray, serve, give. Come. Come to church every week. Join. Join a small group that meets in the life of the church. Pray. Pray for the needs of the world, including coming along to Prayer Central. Um, come join, pray. Serve. Serve in a ministry area in the life of the church. And give of your time, talent, and treasure to enable the ministry here. Come, join, pray, serve, give. And over the next five weeks, I've got the privilege of taking us through. Come, join, pray, serve, give. So that we can all understand what it is to really feel like we belong to this expression of Christ's church local here to St. George's. So today, we are looking at the first week, which is come. The book of Hebrews is written by an unknown author to an unknown congregation. Well, I say an unknown congregation. Obviously, the writer of Hebrews knew exactly who he was writing to. And I assume, although I don't know, that the writer of Hebrews knew that they were a Jewish congregation. Because frankly, to understand the book of Hebrews, you really have to know your Old Testament. Because it's layered thick with Old Testament imagery that you need to understand to make sense of what it means today. And the author of Hebrews, all the way through the book, is writing to a church that's obviously facing persecution, and some people faced with this persecution have ended up leaving the church rather than digging in. So he's writing to them to try and encourage them, two things. Firstly, to see Jesus Christ as supreme over all. Jesus is the supreme Lord of all, and uh, through the different arguments, there's five different arguments in the book of Hebrews, that's what he's trying to underline, Jesus is Lord of all. And secondly, what he's trying to do is encourage them to stay faithful and committed to the teaching of Jesus. Don't turn your back on the greatest gift ever given, is a summary of what he says. You see, Jesus' death on the cross is the ultimate sacrifice that pays a way for us to be forgiven. And our reading today comes from the fifth and final one of those arguments in the book of Hebrews. And it's all about the sacrificial system and how Jesus died once and for all to 
remove our sins from us. You see, back in the Old Testament times, the tabernacle or the temple was made up of a series of sort of concentric chambers with each bit divided either by a curtain or at later a wall. And so uh, the, the imagery here about the curtain is really, um, uh, you, you sort of need to understand it to understand what's going on here. You see, depending on who you were, depended on which level of access you could get at the temple. A bit like a security guard at a pop concert. Depending on what was written on your lanyard, depending on how intimate you could get uh, with uh, the, the, the pop star. You know, not everyone's allowed in the dressing room, but some people might be able to, depending on what's on their lanyard. Well, I'm going to guess in this room, although I don't know this is an assumption, that there's no Jewish people here. So all of us would only be welcome in the outer courts of the temple. If you are Jewish, you would be able to go into the next bit of the temple. And if you were a Jewish man, you were able to go in the next bit of the temple. And if you were a priest, you were able to go in the next bit. But the inner sanctum, the Holy of Holies, was only able to be entered once a year by the high priest who would go in sprinkling the blood of an animal sacrifice in front of him to ensure that he didn't sort of contaminate the Holy of Holies. But he wasn't able to go in there confidently. In fact, he had to tie a rope around his waist. So if he died while he was in there, someone could drag his sorry corpse back out again without having to go in and defile this most holy. But it wasn't a confident entry. But then, Jesus. Jesus comes as the once and for all sacrifice for our sins. No amount of animal sacrifice can ever forgive your sins, the writer of Hebrews says in the chapter before. But Jesus comes as the once and for all sacrifice to take away our sin for us. Let me read again what Trina's just read so wonderfully for us from verse 19. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open to us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart, And with full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled and cleansed from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water, we have confidence to enter God's presence because of what Jesus has done for us. Through Jesus, we can be confident to come to God. Through Jesus, he's made us a way. Through Jesus, we can know that great high priest. Through Jesus, we can draw near. Through Jesus, we can have sincere hearts. Through Jesus, we can know forgiveness of sins. Through Jesus, we can have a guilt-free conscience and be washed as with pure water. And the baffling thing to the uh, uh, congregation that the writer of Hebrews is writing to is many of them knowing all that, yet still are walking away from the faith, which is why he implores them, hold unswervingly, to the hope we profess, for he who promises is faithful. What a great promise for us today. And then we come on to the verses that I want us to focus on for the rest of our time this morning. It says this in verse 24, And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another And all the more as you see the day approaching. Um, Some of you will be runners, no doubt. And some, uh, or some of you will know runners, that over the COVID-19 lockdowns, were unable to run the big races that they used to run. Uh, Races like the London Marathon over lockdown still happened because they had to happen but couldn't happen. They had to happen because... The T-shirts had been printed, the medals had been made, the places had been given. Uh, They had to happen because the charities that get a huge amount of money by the generosity of people giving to mad relatives who run long distances is really needed. And so they had to happen, but they couldn't because of the COVID-19 lockdown. And so what the um, race organizers did, a genius move, was said you can run this race virtually. Download an app track the distance, 
Run it around your back garden or up and down the street or whatever is appropriate for you. Run the 26 miles, but do it virtually. And then once you've tracked it, we will send you in the post your um, medal and T-shirt and whatever else. And, of course, everyone wins. The charities win. The people who have been given the places were able to run. And it was a great solution. But it was, of course, a compromise to the real thing. If you speak to someone who's run both the virtual London Marathon and the physical real London Marathon, they will tell you they're not the same thing at all. There's an otherness that's missing. And that otherness is around hundreds of thousands of people cheering you on. And that otherness is around just the very atmosphere of the capital city that's buzzing with life as the London Marathon happens. And I even heard of one church member who was so aware of the loss of the otherness of being cheered on that she ran uh, like 50 loops of a little section of Burley Park so that she could have a few socially distanced friends at the same point every half mile to give her a cheer on to keep her going through it. When we meet together in church, I'm preaching to the choir now, right? Because you're you're already here, so you already know this. But when you come to church, you get that otherness of what it is to be a church. The atmosphere, the encouragement in your faith from one another, the sense of being together and being in it together rather than being alone elsewhere. You see, to my biggest advice, to belong to a church, first and foremost is to come, to come to the church. And whilst I know, theologically, you can be a Christian and follow Jesus from the comfort of your own home, you never need to step foot in a church. It really helps because you get the encouragement and the atmosphere. There's something of God's spirit that moves powerfully when we gather together to worship Jesus And so whilst the virtual marathon was a good substitute, it was a substitute. I often reflect on our online church. And those of you who are watching online today, I'm delighted you're here. Thank you so much for being part of things today. But I think online church is our best friend and our worst enemy. Let me just explain why. It's our best friend because it... it, It does a brilliant thing for those who I've started to nickname, and I'll explain what I mean by this, the couldn'ts and the wouldn'ts. So there's some people who just couldn't be here today. They're in a nursing home, receiving end-of-life care, watching online. They're very poorly in bed with some awful condition, and therefore they're watching on. They couldn't be here today. They're on a three-week business trip in Australia, and they're really missing it. They couldn't be here, but they're able to watch online. Or they're on their family holiday, and there isn't a church in the destination where they've gone to, so they decide to sit around in their chalet and watch online. They couldn't be here today, but they've chosen to be here through online church. And I think, that not that a wonderful blessing? I like the idea that one day, when I'm too old and decrepit to get to church physically, because I'm in a nursing home, I won't miss out because I'll be able to watch. It's a substitute, but it's a good substitute. So they're the couldn'ts. There's also the wouldn'ts, and I hope there's some of these watching. They wouldn't be seen dead in church. They would not come. They're never going to walk through those doors for months and months and months, but they don't really know why, but just recently God has sort of been saying, go on, have a look. See what these mad Christians are all about. And so they've been a bit intrigued, and we've met them. They say, we've been coming online for months. I never thought it would be me, but now I'm here, and I want to join in. And so a a great evangelistic tool is for us to web stream our services, because people who would never darken our doors, watch, they're the wouldn'ts. And so for the sake of the couldn'ts and the wouldn'ts, we uh, here at St. George's are committed to live streaming as many services as we can, so that the word gets out, and as many people as possible can come. That's why it's the best thing ever. It's our worst enemy, though, Because I know that I'm human and the temptation to just sit on the sofa and watch from home is real every week. Like, oh, do we really have to go? We could just watch online and that would be so much easier. And so it it sort of 
lures us into this. We think that we've been to church because we've seen it, but we've missed out on the otherness of church. Do you remember 19 months ago, I gave you, uh, during a series that we did called what, how, to, how to Walk Into Church, I gave you Topham's Top Tips for Church Tenants. Do you remember this? Can I just remind us all of this? And, and this isn't me trying to get at anyone. So if you feel got at, that's entirely the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I'm not looking anyone in the eye, I promise. I, I, I mean that honestly. I mean that honestly. But let me just remind you. It, my, my, my hope here is that I encourage you. What are the words that Hebrews use? Encourage one another towards love and good works. That's my hope. Not to guilt trip you and get at you. So if you feel guilt tripped and get at, got at, uh, that's my fault. I'm so sorry. That isn't my intention. It's genuinely to cheer us all on as we're a church family together. My top tips before, and I'm going to build on today, were come, pray, and think. Come, pray, and think. Well, actually, they were go, pray, and think, but come worked better for this particular sermon because it's entitled Come, so I've changed it. Come, pray, and think. Um, Martin and I have the privilege of sit, uh, privilege and doom of sitting on the diocesan synod of Lincoln Diocese. Uh, Carl does as well, and others in the room. I won't try and name them all. I forget someone and offend someone. Howard, um, the, I'm not. No, I'll stop there. Um, it's it's a great meeting, isn't it? Isn't that a wonderful meeting? And you look around the room, and you can tell how committed people are by the meeting itself. There are some people in that meeting who have had a busy week. And they just email a one-liner to a secretary and say, I send my apologies to the meeting. That's the level of commitment that's needed to that particular meeting. And they go, I'm not going to be there. They put a question mark in it in their diary. And then there are loads in the, in the meeting, and I've been guilty of this one, where a huge group of people, you get, you get given um, all these papers to read beforehand. And if you read the papers, you can contribute to the meeting. If you haven't read the papers, you're a passenger. You can't do anything. You just sit there like a lemon and put your hand up when other people do. And that's about all you know. You you just don't understand what's going on. And then there are some who have done the homework. They've read the papers and they are vocal. They're active and sometimes even helpful in what they say at the meeting. That's the way it works. And I think it's true of church as well. There are some here who put a question mark in their diary. We've all got meetings like that in the diary, haven't we? When someone says, uh, oh yeah, something's happening, you go, oh yeah, I'll put it in the diary, and you put it in, and you put this massive black question mark, like, yeah, I'm not sure whether I'm going to be there or not. And there are some of us for whom church is that. There's a big question mark each week. Shall we bother this week? I don't know. So we put a question mark in our diary. There are others who are here as passengers, So we just sort of come, show up, go, but don't really interact with what's going on. There's others that are really active members. And of course, the people that get the most out of it are those who are active. Come, pray, and give. Not give. Come, think, and pray. Come, think, and pray. So come along. Decide to being here each week. You know, 1 Peter 2 tells us that we're built like bricks, being built in a into a building that God is going to dwell in himself. And so when we're here, it's like bricks being built together into a building. And so when you're not here, it's like bricks that are missing in a building. Now, I visit some people who have done renovations or whatever in their houses. If I got into your front room and sat down for a cup of tea and there was loads of bricks missing from one of the walls, I'd be really worried about you as a family because you're not safe, you'll be cold, you'll be, you know, it's, it's not great, is it, to have bricks missing out of a building? It's the same true with church. When we're not here, it's like there's bricks missing. And that has an impact on us all. So we need to remember that we're like being, we're be, bricks being built into a, a thing that God is wanting to dwell in himself. Last week, it was wonderful, wasn't it, to have Greg Downs here. I don't know if you were at the 9.15 last week, but it was really full. When church is really full, it has a real buzz to it because there's no bricks missing. And it feels like we're all together, receiving together. I've been doing some playful math. Just go with me on this. Imagine that we are a church of 520 people. 
520 makes the maths really easy when you remember there's 52 weeks in the year. So with 520 people, if we all came every single week, how many people would be here? Great, the mathematicians in the room are all over this. 520 on average. If we just... That's, that's unrealistic though, isn't it? Because I assume that some of us will want to do things like go on holiday every now and again. That's perfectly normal and understandable. So let's say we have sort of four weeks of holiday a year each. Average that over the year. How many weeks? How many people on average? 480. Martin's on, on the numbers. He's good. So four weeks, we drop to 480. Once a month, we see family or friends. We go away on a little trip for the weekend. And therefore, as a result, the average attendance drops down to 360. I don't know who got that first. Well done. 360. And once a month, we have a business trip or an engagement that means we're not around and therefore can't get and therefore average that across the congregation we drop down to 240 and then three weeks of the year we're either ill or frankly cannot be bothered and there's no point in this going because we're not in the right frame of mind we drop down again to 210 so suddenly our church of 520 people through what I would see as quite normal stuff of family engagements and illness and holiday and business trips or whatever suddenly we're 210 just by deciding to come, you make a wonderful, wonderful decision that helps us all as a church because we come like those blocks being built together. And as I said last time, come early when you're able. Not everyone will be able to get here early, but I'll tell you the two people who do come early, brand new people and people in pastoral crisis. And last week, before the service began, before anyone from the congregation was here, I'd welcomed four new newcomers. The welcome team, we're really grateful for all you're doing today, Lee and Abby and Claire. The welcome team are the stewarding team. You, the congregation, are the welcoming team. As people come and sit next to you, you say, it's great to see you, welcome. It's so good to have you with us. And really make them feel welcome. Do you know how you belong in a place? Become the host, not the guest. Let me say that again. To belong in a place, become the host, not the guest. And so, therefore, if we get here, I'm not talking two hours early, I'm talking ten minutes early. If we get here ten minutes early, we're able to function as the host, to welcome people in, to cheer people on, to hook up with old friends. And then when people come in late, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. They've probably moved heaven and earth to be here in the first place. They've just ushered their four non-compliant children out of the door and got here in time. Give up your seat for them. Make them feel welcome. They're the heroes who have battled against all the odds to even turn up in the first place. So those of you who are early, let's get here. Uh, those of you who are able, let's get here early. To belong here, you come. Secondly, to belong here, you pray. Pray for the church. Pray each week earnestly in your prayers that God would bring all of those bricks into play, that we're all being built together. Pray that as we meet together, something of God's Spirit would be at work in our congregations. Pray that just as we heard from Neil this morning, as we, as we hear testimonies, we would hear of God's work in our lives. Pray that we would be added to uh, daily those who are being saved. Pray that God's Spirit would be ministering to us. And lastly, think, like that boring diocesan synod meeting. If you've read the papers, you can contribute. Don't wait for the preacher to do all the work. Read the reading before you come and think, if I was preaching on this, what would I be saying? I wonder whether Martin or Ben or whoever's preaching will say similar things. Do the thinking yourself. Make some notes ahead of your small group meeting so that you can contribute there as well. If you want to know where you find the passage to read it, there's a uh, a term card at the back with all of the readings for the next term on there so that you can be thinking about what's coming up. It's also on the weekly email that comes out. Again, join Church Suites if you haven't. Pray, come, think. I hope that's helpful. How do I belong here? Well, firstly, we come. 
We come as often as is practical. We come ready to meet and engage with Almighty God. We come willing to receive all that the Spirit wants to give to us. We come desperate for the presence of God and desperate to worship the Lord Jesus. We come early. We come prayerfully. We come thoughtfully. We come with expectation. And so come to church. It is both a destination and a launch pad. It's a destination because here we find life and encouragement and it's a launch pad as it launches us off into the week ahead to minister the kingdom in whatever setting we're in. And above all, do not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this, your church, for the blood of Christ that is sprinkled over all our sin, which means we can come into your presence confidently and expectant of all that you're going to do in and through us whenever we gather. And Lord, I pray that we would all have a deep, deep sense of belonging here. Help us, we pray, to come to church, to belong to that bride of Christ, the, the body of Christ, the building that's being built for Christ here in Stamford and indeed the whole world. And just lay on our hearts now, we pray, by your Spirit, that which you want us to take away from the service today. And Lord, we give ourselves to you afresh. And ask your blessing on us as a church. In Jesus' name, amen. Shall we stand together? Death has lost it. 
its grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living hope then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me jesus yours is the victory its grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living hope jesus christ my living hope oh god you So let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess. For he who promised is faithful, and let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Father, thank you for your presence with us this morning. Thank you for our presence with each other this morning as we encourage one another in our faith in Jesus Christ, our living hope. Thank you that we know your presence when we gather. Thank you that we know your Holy Spirit goes with us as we go out into the world. And as we've come to this place this morning, so we pray that you would send us out in the power of your Holy Spirit, to be light in a dark world, to be hope in a hopeless world, to be your life in places where there is death and sickness. And Almighty God, you are the living God. Would you be at work in us to bring your life to those around us? Open our lips to speak the words that Jesus and the Holy Spirit gives to us this week. And so may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Well, the service is finished, but church hasn't. Do stay around for coffee and tea. Don't forget your children, but you've got until quarter to, uh, quarter to 11 to go and collect them, enjoy each other's company, and do encourage one another.